this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 6th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we look at where this year's budget cycle is leaving us as we look forward to the years ahead. Second, we look at this session's discussions around Cook Inlet gas and explain why it's mostly involved going in circles while the market moves ahead. And third, we describe who we think are Alaska's real super socialists, those who have benefited the most from the state's flow of free money. And now, let's join Michael. Well, the weekly top three <clears throat> should commence right about now. And uh, let's uh, let's get into it. Number one is, uh, I mean, where are we headed from here? And could it get even worse? That's the, that's the question. Hit us with it this morning. Where are we at? So uh, Rob Myers did some of this yesterday on the show, but I sort of want to beat, beat it, beat the drum a little bit more. I've been spending the last uh, few days sort of looking at the spending that we're doing this session. You'll recall in the show last week, I said they've spent it all uh, and even more uh, than, uh, than, than what they anticipated they, they, would, they would spend earlier in the session. Um, and I've been looking at what the consequences of that are over the next 10 years, which is the usual budget, budget cycle, uh, forward-looking budget cycle that we use. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a bad picture, Michael. Uh, there's a chart I've done that will be in, uh, in this week's, uh, uh, landmine that, uh, that looks at where we are in FY24 and then looks from FY25, uh, forward and FY24, I've got two segments in there. I've got the revenue line, which is from the spring revenue revenue forecast at the top. Uh, the traditional revenues, and then looks at where we were at the start of the session and where we are now approaching the end of the session. And I've started looking at this in a somewhat different way than others have and then that I have historically, which is how much of the how much is the deficit as a percent of the POMV draw? Because what we've seen the legislature do over the last five years, six years, is use a leftover PFD approach, which is the PFD is whatever is left over at the end of of drawing of of taking money from the POMV, the percent of market value draw. Um, and so I've started looking at the percentage of of how much the deficit is as a percent of the POMV draw to try to get a sense of how much is left for the PFD at the end under the approach they've used over the last five years. And it really it really gets. Um, <laughs> I mean, this session is being underrated in terms of the amount of additional spending the legislature is layering on. It is every bit as much of, of a problem in this session as it was in the early 20 teens in terms of in terms of the additional spending that they're doing. When you look at the at, at FY24, the enacted budget, the, the budget that they enacted at the end of last year. Ledge Finance's analysis is that they left the building with UGF spending of about $5.28 billion, $5.26 billion rather, and uh, had a projected deficit after traditional revenues of about $2.24 billion. That projected deficit represented about 64% of the, 
of the of the POMB draw. This session alone, in terms of the supplemental, they've increased spending, FY24 spending, just through the supplemental. They, they've increased it by, excuse me a second, they, they've increased it by 6%. Um, and they've jumped FY24 spending from $5.26 billion, where it was when they left the building at the end of last session, to now $5.58 billion. They've added roughly another 300 some odd billion dollars in spending. The deficit that at the end of the regular session last year was about 64% of the POMB draw for uh, FY24 has now jumped to 73%. For FY24. FY25, when Senator Stedman says we've spent it all, we've, we're right up against the line, we're running right against the line, he's absolutely right. When they when when Ledge Finance looked at the outlook uh, for spending, the 10-year outlook for spending at the beginning of this session, uh, they had FY25 pegged at 5.11, uh, uh, five billion hundred million dollars. Uh, with a with a projected deficit uh, POMB draw uh, of 63 uh, percent, uh, when you look at where they've where they're ending up this session in terms of FY25, it's eight percent higher than where they than where legislative finance projected it at the beginning of the session, eight percent higher at 5.5 5.5 billion, which is a 75 percent draw from the PFD or POMV in order to in order to balance the budget. As Bert says, they're right up against the line that their their artificial 2575 line of using the POMV. But that's not that's not the really that's not the really amazing thing or the really disturbing thing of what's going on. When you project out using legislative finances projections of a of, of, of percentage growth rate that they had, uh, that they used in the initial analysis earlier this session. When you apply that to the new base of 5.5 billion uh, that, they're, that, they're, that they're putting into the FY25 budget and look across, the, look across the years, you see, and I've got these numbers in red, you see the, the POMB draw, the portion of the POMB draw that has to go to the, that goes to covering the deficit going from 73% uh, in FY24 to 75% in FY25, and then to 80% in FY26, 27, 81% in FY28, and it continues to go upwards of there. Uh, in FY20, uh, FY30, it reaches 86% and 86% uh, in, FY, in FY31. That leaves, I mean, this is simple arithmetic, right? If you if you can if we continue to use the leftover approach to the PFD, that leaves only uh 20% in FY25 and FY26 for the PFD, and by FY30 and FY31 leaves only 14% available to the to the to the PFD. So it they've redone, they they've spent a huge amount. As I say, the FY26 spend, uh, FY24 spending has jumped by 6% just through the supplementals. Uh, the FY25 has jumped by 8%, over 8% since the, since the projection given by LFD or legislative finance just in January, just five months ago. It's jumped 8% from where they anticipated FY25 would be. And then you know you just extrapolate that out or, uh, across the years, and uh, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And we may not be finished yet. In uh, uh, in an ADN column, uh, uh, analyzing the, the 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 potential of adding of layering on a new uh, retirement plan, uh, a new uh, 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 defined contribute defined benefit retirement plan that the legislature is considering and that the house is starting to move again uh, we have a discussion down uh, in that column or down in that in that article that talks about what the cost of that could be and here's here's I mean the numbers that these people bandy about and just sort of treat them as as pennies is amazing the actuarial we, we've talked about this before on the show but the actuarial analysis, that the legislature got at the beginning or at the end of last session 
uh, about what the, 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 the change to defined benefits could cost, said that it could cost the state more than $1 billion over the course of 14 years. As the Senate processed it, um, they did they did their own actuary anal- actuarial analysis and said all oh, the cost would be less, uh, but they but they had the numbers back into the actuary that the that the that the state normally uses for these things, and the and the and the actuary hadn't come back. They've now come back, and and here's what Senator Giesel said: part of the reason that the House was delaying working on this bill on the defined benefit bill is that they were waiting for those scenarios, the numbers to come back. Well, we have those scenarios now, Giesel said. They generally show that the cost of the pension plan will likely be likely be below a billion dollars for the 14-year period examined. Not zero, not a little bit, but below a billion dollars. Uh, still in that range uh, that, that, we, that, the, that the actuaries were talking about uh, before. Uh, changing depending upon the number of current employees who switch from the defined contribution to the defined benefit plan. Well, the whole purpose of this is to get people to switch from the defined contribution to the defined benefit plan and the number of employees who are enticed to remain in their jobs long-term by pension option. Well, the whole point of this is to get people to stay in their jobs. So if you uh, if you take those assumptions as the actuaries did in the first analysis, it cost over a billion dollars. Now they've refined it and it's a little bit under a billion dollars, but that's still what we're talking about. And you jump back to these numbers that are in the chart and you look at the potential deficit amounts out there in the future of, of you know, $2.74 billion, $3 billion, um, $3.16 billion, $3.24 billion. The line, uh, the numbers right be- right above the red, right above the percent of uh, whatever the percent of market value that represents. When you look at those and you say, well, you know, just a little bit more for pensions, maybe a little bit less than four- than a billion over 14 years. Well, you know, a little less over than a billion is another $90 million, another $100 million uh, per year over that over that period. And you just dig the hole deeper and deeper and deeper. And you're taking more and more and more of the POMB to fund it. So I, I, I I'll, I'll write a column on this at some point. But uh, but we have really under understated the amount of additional spending that's being lay, layered on by this legislature alone, right? And and the impact of of where that's leading us in the future. Rob Meyer says it's even worse than you're saying, Brad. You're only including current what's currently in the budget. He says it's not counting a couple of bills expected to pass and the outstanding labor contracts. So, no, I've got those numbers in. I've got those numbers in now for FY25. What it's not including, what what Rob's referring to is an analysis that uh, Alexi Painter did by for LFD from LFD did for Ways and Means, and that analysis sort of uh, topped up. Uh, some of the categories of spending for uh, uh, the the current statutory requirements, for example, school bond reimbursement, some of those other things. You can get it worse if you do that. They haven't included it in this budget. But if you do include those going forward, if you say next year we're going to go ahead and and top up all those amounts that, that, that we should be spending, then you can make those numbers make those numbers a lot worse. But I but I have restated this chart in order to incorporate the additional items that uh, that the legislature is doing in this session. So we're going to be increasing the budget deficit by over a billion dollars over the next four or five years and then drawing it all out of the POMV. And that means, of course, it cuts right into the PFD. Rob was mentioning this yesterday, talking about, <clears throat> you know, they're already talking about a PFD of only five or six hundred bucks, uh, you know, 12, 13, 14 percent, because that's what they see. And again, they're going to consume every available dollar in the room. Final thoughts here on this one, Brad. Well, we we're not getting this under control. I mean, Bert will tell you that that you know when it comes to Senate finance, they're hard nosed and they look at spending and they and they keep it under control. They're not. They're adding to the problem. House finance is adding to the problem. Senate finance is adding to the problem. They're not keeping it under control. And if we don't look at other mechanisms to keep it under control, and frankly, I don't have much confidence in the spending cap. But if we don't look at other mechanisms to get this under control, it's just going to continue to spin. I mean, if you look at these numbers, it's just going to continue to spin farther and farther and farther out of control going forward. Brian says, but folks just got to get reelected, Brad. You just don't understand. (laughs) Just got to get 
they got to get reelected, Brad. That's it, you know, and that's really, again, part of what part of what about Rob was talking about yesterday. If all we ever think of is in one year budget to budget increments or every two years, four year uh, election to election increments, this is what we get. Right. I mean, this is this is the problem right here. We get a bunch of people who basically just say, don't worry, it'll be fine. Forget about that 10 year forecast. And you don't really need that PFD, period. That's that's essentially what's coming out of all this. And the problem, Michael, is the terminology. Uh, the terminology they're using is just is just is is encouraging this. So, for example, last year, at the end of last year, they left the budget. Uh, they left the budget, and they and they used twenty five seventy five to set the PFD, and they didn't spend all of it last year. So they called the remainder of it surplus. They called the remainder between what they what they appropriated and and the the amount of revenue at 2575 they called that surplus. So you had people during the course of the year saying, "Oh, there's a surplus. We get to spend the surplus." I mean, at one point the at least Galvin wrote a column in the ADN that was signed on by all of the house minority that said, you know, talking about K through 12 spending and that they ought to override override the governor's veto and she said, "Well, there's a surplus. So what's the problem?" You know, we can, we've got, we've got more money to spend. And, and even the terminology is, is creating problems. I mean, they, 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 they get down there and they think, well, we've got a surplus or we've got more revenues or, you know, something's happened and, and we can just keep spending and all the pressures on spending. There's never, I mean, the, the way the setup is, is the spending all occurs one place and then, yeah, we need to worry about revenues over here, but they're not meshed up. You get people who criticize. I, I remember during the course of the House session, House uh, committee sessions this year, especially in education, you had uh, Jamie Allard who would ask uh, uh, witnesses and ask uh, uh, other representatives who were proposing additional spending, who pays? You know, the question that, that you and I have talked about on the show, who pays? And she got chewed out by Bryce Edgman at one point saying, well, that's not a relevant question for this committee. You know, we'll, we'll address that over in finance. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that when we get to finance. And, and, and so the entire setup down there, you know, the use of the term surplus, the use of the, you know, the, the, the structures which, you know, you aren't supposed to talk about who pays when, you, when you're uh, considering additional spending in some, in some of the committees. It, it's all set up not to keep the pressure on for, for spending. Bert said, Bert's been on record saying, well, I'm going to, I'm going to hold the line. You know, I'm the, we're the last ones in this committee that sees this stuff out. We're going to hold the line. Well, they don't. They add to the problem. I mean, as we talked about on the show last week, the, 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 the legislative finance presentation showed them that they were tapped out for FY25. All of the additional bills they had, all of the additional uh, stuff they did, uh, 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 was going to tap them out, bring them right to the line, right to uh, POMB 2575. And yet Kelly Merrick, <laughs> the senator from Eagle River, added more, proposed an amendment that added more spending uh, on top of that. So it's they just, they don't have, there isn't a sense of, of keeping this stuff under control. And I'm, and I'm sure this will trigger a bunch of comments in the chat room, but but part of the reason is the top 20%, all of the legislators, which in which all of the legislators fall, the top 20% don't have to pay for any of it. They're pushing it all off on middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. And so who cares? You know? Yeah. Let's um, take a little bit more out of, out of their pockets. Looking again back at this chart, I mean, is this, and this is like best case estimates, right? This is legislative finances. These are best case estimates. This is not... <laughs> Any additional spending? Go ahead, uh, real quick, Brad. Yeah, it's not it's not any additional spending. The the additional, I mean, and you can see the the, the deterioration that goes on during the course of the year. FY twenty five, uh, LF uh, legislative finance uh, uh, estimated it at five spending at five point eleven. By the end of this year, we were four hundred million dollars above that at five point five three. So, e yeah, it's best case. This is, yeah, this is not even worst case. This is just, you know, this is the Pollyanna version of what we've got going on here. Welcome back to the program. Brad Keithley, our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, ak4sb.com. If you want to find him on the web or go argue with him on Twitter, he loves that. He loves to argue on Twitter or X or whatever the hell it's called these days. Brad, number two of the weekly top three, 
Um, and it's uh, much ado about nothing, maybe, possibly, or maybe something good. I don't know. What What do we got here? Well, this is uh, that that refers to the Cook Inlet energy bills, the South Central energy bills that have been uh, up before the legislature. We've had a lot of discussion about them in the legislature. We've had a lot of discussion about them uh, on this show. And as we approach the end, and I sort of sit back and reflect on uh, on what's going on, uh, I think I, I, I don't think we've moved the needle uh, much in terms of of solving this problem. I think the market is solving the problem on its own, uh, and I think the legislative session has just sort of been a giant swirl around uh, around uh, you know trying to intervene and 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 control the control the market outcomes. The, there's two bills that are really out there now that address this, that are purported to address this problem. One is in the House that the House voted on uh, this past week uh, that includes uh, uh, things like uh, 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 regulation of storage, gas storage, and some other things uh, uh, involved in uh, in connection with uh, in connection with uh, uh, the Cook Inlet problem. Um, and then HB 50, I think it is, which is over in the uh, Senate, which is now yeah, HB 50, which has now become sort of the omnis, omnibus bill on energy as Senate resources sort of gathered in a bunch of other bills, put them in one bill uh, to address the problem. And uh, and that's that bill is now before Senate finance that uh, that bill began as the carbon capture bill, the, the bill to authorize the state to lease uh, 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 portions of the mineral estate, portions of the subsurface estate to be used for carbon capture, but other things have been thrown on it uh, in uh, in Senate uh, resources. Uh, Cook Inlet seismic data, the ability to uh, allow producers to have access to Cook Inlet seismic data that the state has uh, in its records uh, for for no cost, uh, in order to allow the producers to sort of evaluate new new potential. Uh, without incurring any additional cost. The gas storage facilities regulation, what the Senate's really done is taken the bill that the House just struggled through to pass on the floor. They've taken that bill uh, and they've incorporated it in uh, in HB 50 uh, with some changes from, from what the House passed, which I, good changes, uh, in my opinion, from uh, from what the House passed. The House passed a provision in its bill that essentially tried to bar utilities from owning LNG import facilities uh, in another another step at the protectionism that you and I have talked about. If the, if the utilities can't own LNG import facilities, then maybe they'll go buy Cook Inlet gas, right, even, right. If, even if at a higher price. Uh, the, House, uh, the House barred that. The Senate bill doesn't do that. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Senate bill, HB 50, uh, incorporates Cook Inlet reserve-based lending, which I have, I struggle with. But it allows uh, ADA to, or the Alaska Energy Authority, to uh, loan money to producers when producers are having difficulty finding financing. Loan money to producers in order to develop reserves, and it's reserves-based lending because the security, the collateral, on the loan are the reserves. That sort of goes in a circle. I mean, the state owns the reserves already, right? I mean, we've leased them to the producers to develop. Right. The producers, producers are supposed to develop them. And now the state's saying, well, we'll give you, we'll, we'll loan you money. And if you don't develop them, we get the reserves back. So we'll we use our collateral to loan you money. I mean, that's exactly, uh, that makes zero. I mean, wow, that's a circle. I mean, wow. So, so we will have bought them twice if, uh, if, 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 if we, if we loan them money and then they default on the obligation. The one addition that the Senate made in Senate resources that I think is a plus, others won't, but I think it's a plus. Uh, is that Bill Wilikowski got an amendment done in Senate resources to undo the the uh, the loophole that Hillcorp's been taking advantage of to avoid about a hundred million dollars in production taxes annually in production taxes over the since they bought BP uh, in the in the twenty teens um, and that hundred million dollars is money that that it's a loophole that applies only to or largely only to Hillcorp. Conoco pays full pays the full taxes. Exxon pays the full taxes, but Hillcorp's getting off with paying about a hundred million dollars less because of the corporate structure they have. Willikowski's 
amendment in Senate resources closed that loophole and raised a hundred million dollars, raises a hundred million dollars. That's part of the of the discussions you and I have had in the past about, you know, how do we how do we get more revenue? How should we get more revenue? Uh, and that's one of the ways. I think that hundred million dollars that that Hillcorp's been been able to glean by by his corporate structure is is not justified. And I think Hillcorp ought to be paying at the same rate that the other producers are paying, same corporate tax rate that the other producers are paying. So that that closure of that loophole, I think, is a is a is a big plus. Now, whether that survives, it was added in Senate resources. Uh, whether that survives Senate finance and whether it survives when it gets on the Senate floor and whether that survives the process of going back over to the House uh, is is another question. But I think it's a step forward that at least Senate resources has adopted. Uh, and it's not, you know, some people want to say, oh, it's a huge tax increase. Well, it's not. It's not a tax increase. It's a closure of a tax, tax loophole. Yes, they will pay more in taxes, but they're just paying at the same rate uh, under the same structure that that the other corporations, Conoco and the other major corporate old corporations in the state, Conoco and and um, and uh, and Exxon and Santos will pay when it gets Pika online. It's the same. It's the same basic corporate structure, and they're just closing that loophole. Um, and so when Aoga goes around with ads saying, "Oh, we can't we can't increase taxes on cook inlet production," well, a it's not just on cook inlet production. It really, most of that hundred million is coming from is a benefit from uh, Hillcorp's North Slope production, from the old uh, BP production that it has. It's not related to the cook inlet, uh, and B, it's not a tax increase. It is it's the closure of a tax loophole and pulling Hillcorp up to the same level that, as everybody else. I think the net net is is we're going to end this session hopefully without the subsidies, the major subsidies I've been concerned about. Uh, which is the, the 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 waiver of royalty on uh, on Cook Inlet production, uh, which is a subsidy to Cook Inlet producers and to and to Cook Inlet uh, uh, consumers, and hopefully uh, the uh, the the reserve based lending, which uh, is in the Senate bill before Senate finance, but but I continue to have struggle with because it is just this giant circle. We're gonna we're gonna loan on reserves that we already own. Uh, hopefully that'll get stripped out at some point along the way, if the bill passes at all. This all may go down in flames. We may be back to where we started. Uh, but I think where we started was very simple. The market says imported LNG is the cheapest source of supply, the most secure so source of supply, a source of supply which is competitive with uh, Cook Inlet uh, supplies. And we ought to be pursuing, the utilities ought to be pursuing the cheapest source of supply out there. We ought to get the cost of Alaska living down or at least stabilized as opposed to letting it uh, explode, which is what uh, what these subsidies and what uh, uh, continually pursuing cook inlet production without regard to what the cost of it is uh, it would lead us. So all this discussion, all this crisis, all this energy thing, I mean, was this all just sound and fury signifying nothing? Was it a, was it a, you know, just kind of this circle think on everything? Should they have just left it alone to, from the beginning? What, what, what's your take? Well, well, politicians, politicians can't leave things alone. I mean, you know, you got, you got Ed Star saying there's a crisis. So you, you, you got, you know, you've got uh, all this, all these scare tactics out there about we're running short of Cook Inlet gas. We're not running short of gas. There's a, a huge abundance of gas in the world that's accessible to South Central through imported LNG. But all of this, you know, all of this crisis, politicians can't leave that alone. So yeah, it, it was probably necessary to go through this circle and explore and explore things such as, well, let's waive uh, royalty. Let's subsidize and see if that solves the problem or let's Let's commit to loan money to these producers to see if that solves the problem. It's probably necessary to go through that circle to, you know, sort of exhaust the the remedies that that people quickly, you know, jump to. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, we're going to end up this session right back where we started, which is there is there is the the Cook Inlet is unable to meet market demand over the over the long term. Production from the Cook Inlet is unable to meet market demand over the long term, and so we ought to be looking at alternatives. And if Cook Inlet you know, if producers can come forward with with projects in Cook Inlet that can be lower cost than uh, than LNG, then great. Let's do that. Let's go out and get it. But let's not subsidize it 
at a at a greater cost to Alaskans. Let's not subsidize it uh, to uh, to to protect uh, to protect that market. Let's look for the lowest cost right. supplies, and I think that's where we're going to end up. Well, and I think again, it goes back to that emotional thing of oh, we need Alaskan gas. Well, does that make sense? I mean, hey. We need Alaskan beef and we need Alaskan carrots and we need Alaskan. Sometimes that stuff is just not economically feasible. Sometimes it's better to bring it in than it is to uh, try and develop it here. Would it be nice? I mean, from a security point of view to make sure that we have it on hand? Sure, that would be great. But is it three times the cost? Can we afford to do that? Can people afford to stay here if that's what the cost is going to be? I mean, why, why the reticence, uh, you know, on the imported LNG, Brad? One minute. Well, and the scare tactic around that is that, well, LNG is going to cost more. What people don't focus on is that Cook Inlet costs even more than that. That's what the analysis from last year from the from the utility working group uh, told us was that Cook Inlet to develop additional Cook Inlet supplies are going to cost even more than LNG. So prices are going up regardless. Uh, it, it just turns out that LNG, according to that analysis, LNG is the cheapest of the higher prices that have to be paid. In order to keep uh, in order to keep the supply going, so much hot air and gas coming out of uh, out of Juno, we might be able to heat the whole state if we keep it up going on there. Um, all right, Brad, let's uh, let me go back here through uh, some of the comments to see. Yeah, Rob Rob is echoing my comments. He says it's like me using your house as collateral for my mortgage. <laughs> it's, <laughs> that's the development authority. I mean, we lease you the land that we own to develop gas on it, and then we're going to loan you money based on the reserves that you find, and we're going to keep... We already own it. I don't... It is such a circle jerk. I don't even understand how you could justify that. It, it's really... I mean, it's really odd when you think about it, Michael. If the if the producer who has leased the land can't develop it, can't, can't comply with the lease obligations to develop it, can't get financing or whatever else it is, can't can't move forward and develop it then then the way this the system is supposed to work is the lease is supposed to revert to the state so it can be leased to somebody else right and we can get we can get money out of somebody else the the, the what we're doing here think about this we've leased them the land they can't develop it it's supposed to come back to us but rather than taking it back we're going to give them more money <laughs> in order to develop it and if they fail to develop it, if they if they continue to do what they've done thus far, which is fail to develop it, then then the security on our loan is we get the land back that we own anyway. It's just it, and it's, had to pay and had to pay millions of dollars out that we'll never see again. I mean, again, I'm all for supporting the businesses and doing development and all that, but I mean that makes zero sense whatsoever. Now I understand that there's a the environmentalists and everything else have made the financing components difficult and all that. But at some point, you just got to go, how much money do we have to throw after money to, to make it justified to develop it? it, it and, and, and the other thing, Michael, is if if somebody owns a lease and they can't develop it and 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 they're, they're coming to the end of their term where they're going to have to give the land back, they'll sell it rather than rather than just let it go poof. Uh, in terms of in terms of uh, in, in terms of the value of the of the asset, they'll sell it to somebody to develop it, right? And there's a willing buyer out there in terms of Hillcorp who has you know Cook Inlet infrastructure who could go buy uh, that asset and develop it. Who has financing uh, uh, to in order to develop it? Who's an existing Cook Inlet supplier who could go add that supply to their? But instead of doing that, <laughs> instead of just saying okay. Let the market work. We have Republicans. I mean, Republicans are, are at, the, at, the, at the forefront of this. Republicans saying, oh, no, don't do what a normal what the market normally has you do. Here, we'll give you more money <laughs> in order to continue to prevent the market from operating. It's a I, this this whole le reserve based lending is just a giant, giant. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know what the hell to call it. I mean, it's just it, it's just a giant circle that's going on out there, and it's, and it's and, a and, circle jerk. It's a circle jerk, Brad. Yeah. That's what it is. It's it, it you know, it's a self it's a self licking ice cream cone where they just kind of you know consume everything while they're basically again it sounded fury signifying nothing. They're just consuming all the money in the meanwhile trying to find a solution for a problem, and in the end they've consumed all the money and still not solved the problem. Yeah, that, that's a, I mean that's what's going on. 
And it's not, I mean, if we had, if we had a shortage of, I mean, to use your analogy, if we had a shortage of carrots in this state, we wouldn't throw, we wouldn't go, you know, spend a whole lot of state money. We shouldn't go spend a whole lot of state money in order to develop carrots. We would just go and order carrots from, you know, outside markets, hopefully the cheapest market out there in right. order to supply ourselves carrots. Well, but th this, this whole cooking like gas deal just spun off into its own, its own it's structure. It's all based in emotion, right? I mean, at this point, because I mean, sure, it would be nice to have Alaskan gas and we've got tons of it. We have trillions of cubic feet of gas up on the North Slope and we've got, I'm sure there's millions or billions in the, in the Cook Inlet somewhere and it would be nice to find it. But what is the cost? What is the cost of it? If it's two or three times what it costs to import something, why would you do that? Simply for the security of knowing it's in your own backyard? Well, great. But in the meanwhile, you're paying two or three times the cost of that product assuming that one day things are going to go, you know, pear-shaped and you'll, you'll be happy that it's there. In the meanwhile, you've expended thousands and millions of dollars in resources that you didn't need to. And the, the other, uh, another thing about this, Michael, is that, the, that there's not a, a huge expectation that this is going to work, right? In the debate I had with John Sims on the Alaska landmine, one of the things Sims said toward the end of the debate that just, that just stunned me was, well, you know, Hillcorp said even, or not Hillcorp, uh, Hex said, John Hendricks's company said, even if we, you know, waive royalty, then they're not, they're still not going to develop. They need a loan in order to develop uh, their, their property. So, you know, we're going through all this uh, without an expectation that it's going to, that's going to produce results at the end. But politicians at least are seem to be doing something. Brad Keithley is our guest from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. It is the weekly top three, and we're up to number three of the big three. And this one is Alaska's super socialists. I am super socialism. Uh, just peel it off. And he's got the big red hammer and sickle on his chest. What uh, What's going on here, Brad? All right. So this past week, since I wrote the last landmine column, uh, I've had a number of people pop up who's saying, well, the PFD socialist, all, all you're trying to do is preserve the socialist system uh, of, of taking this free money that the, that the legislature has and giving it to, to Alaskan families uh, instead, of, instead of using it for other purposes. Well, let's, let's think for a moment about what the other purpose is of this free money. The free money does two things. One, it funds a PFD, permanent fund dividend, and then it funds something else. Uh, what it does is it uh, protects Alaskans from having to pay taxes. We've called that, I've called that in the past in uh, on the program and in columns, the tax avoidance dividend. Some people think about that. Well, it goes to pay for government. Well, it does. But in the course of that, it protects Alaskans from having to pay taxes. That free money is being used to protect Alaskans from having to pay taxes. And who does that tax avoidance dividend help? Who does it protect? Well, it largely protects the top 20% who would otherwise have to pay some portion of the cost of government, which they don't using PFD cuts. It protects the oil companies from pressure to increase their tax levels to the, to the, you know, the, the fully, the, the, the amount that the state ought to be receiving from, uh, from its resources, uh, something that we've talked about on the show before, 400 to 500 million dollars, including the Hillcorp uh, tax loophole, and it also protects non-residents uh, and the industries that employ non-residents uh, from having to from having to pay taxes, and those industries from from likely having to increase their wages to cover at least a portion of the taxes that the non-residents otherwise uh, would pay. So it's it, that tax avoidance dividend is protecting a given a given class the top 20 percent uh the, the oil companies and uh, and non-residents it protects them more than the pfd it's a it's a greater benefit to them than the pfd is to middle and lower income alaska families we did a calculation once in the in the landmine uh, of how much that tax avoidance dividend is worth to the top 20 percent and to the top 1%, it varies depending upon where you fall, what your income is in that top 20%. But to the top 1%, that tax avoidance dividend is worth about $100,000. Uh, 
uh, in terms of the taxes that they avoid uh, by reason of, of using the free money uh, to, uh, to pay for government, to, to, uh, to avoid taxes, to cover the taxes uh, that they would otherwise pay. So when we're talking about socialism and when we're talking about who benefits from this free money, and isn't it a bad thing that we have these PFDs, that we distribute this free money to Alaska families, we're also distributing uh, this free money to the benefit of the top 20% in terms of the tax avoidance dividend, to the, ben of the benefit of the oil companies, and to the benefit of non-residents in the industries that employ uh, non-residents. And they are receiving their a share of the benefit of that um, uh, of that uh, of that free money. Now, when Hammond originally constructed the the PFD, it was fifty percent uh, to be distributed as PFD, and fifty percent to be used essentially for this tax avoidance dividend to be to pay for government in lieu of taxes uh, uh, when uh, when circumstances required. Now that we've gotten to the point where we ought to be kicking into that third piece of Hammond's fiscal policy, the pay taxes, uh, when, the, when the, the other half of the, of the permanent fund earnings are no longer sufficient to cover the cost of government, uh, where people are supposed to pay taxes, now that we've gotten to that third, that third piece of Hammond's fiscal policy, what's happening is the top 20%, the oil companies and, and non-residents are saying, oh, no. We still want no taxes. We still want the benefit of the tax avoidance dividend. Just take it out of the PFD. Just take more and more out of the PFD uh, as you're going along. Reduce the share that goes to the middle and lower to the benefit of middle and lower income Alaska families. Increase the share of the free money that's coming to us, to the top 20%, to the oil companies and to the non-resident uh, industries employing non-residents uh, by by continue by expanding the, the portion of the free money. Is going to our benefit. To me, that's super socialism. What they're saying is, I know I'm. I know that the original structure was I was only supposed to get fifty. That that I, that fifty percent was supposed to go to the tax avoidance dividend to my benefit. I know that that was the that that was the original plan. But now that we've come to the point where the next step kicks in, where I have to pay taxes to pay for the amount over. Uh, the, the tax avoidance dividend, where I have to pay for additional costs of government over that. I want to keep my free ride going and let's just take it more and more and more and more out of middle and lower income Alaska families through more and more and more cuts to the PFD. It's a zero sum game. The, the free money's either going to the PFD or it's going to the tax avoidance dividend. And, and, and what's happened now is that we've gotten to the point where people ought to be paying taxes, where the original Hammond 50-50 uh, plan, the original Hammond fiscal plan was that people ought to be paying taxes if we have to, if we, if we, if we spend so much that we go above the other 50%. Now that we've gotten to that point, the super socialists are saying, no, give me more, give me more of that free money. Give me more of that free money. And and right. You know, and when you go back to the original, to the to the first segment on the show, and you look at that chart, and you look at how much of of the POMV now is going to be used to pay for government, think of that in terms of the tax avoidance dividend. We're going from seventy three percent in FY twenty four to seventy five percent in FY twenty five to eighty percent in FY twenty six to eighty six percent in FY thirty. We're, we're putting more and more and more into the tax avoidance dividend. Why? Because the top 20%, the oil companies and the, and the non-resident industries, the in industries that employ the non-residents don't want to pay. So they want more and more of that free money to their benefit. I, you know, if you're going to look at the PFD as socialism, let's be fair. The tax avoidance dividend is socialism also. And 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 it's it's already bigger than the PFD in terms of its benefit to the top twenty percent. Now they want even more of it. The super socialists want even more of it. My argument would be: What's more socialistic, taking all the money, or taking you know taking a portion of the money, giving it to the people, allowing them to use it in the free market to as they see fit, as the market would bear, or to take all that money? And to give it to government to then build more government dependency, to build larger programs, to be everything to everybody. Which one of those two is more socialistic in the long run? 
Yep. Uh, I mean, that, you know, when government controls the means of production in everything, that's the definition of socialism. And we're seeing it now. I mean, the latest example is the is the child care stuff, right? We're going to spend another $7 million on child. I mean, you know, when they become everything to everybody, that is the definition of socialism. It is, Michael. And and who's pushing for that? I mean, we have people put, people pushing for spending. Kathy Giesel, Senator Gath, Kathy Giesel from South Anchorage is pushing for increased uh, government spending on defined, returning to defined benefits program. Julie Cologne, uh, representative from also from South Anchorage, Republican representative from South Anchorage, is pushing, pushing for the child care spending. When you look at the people pushing for it, uh, it's, it's Republicans who want this increased socialism, this increased state spending, but they don't want to pay for it. They want to make sure that, they're, that they, since they're all in the top 20%, and their donors don't have to pay for it, that they get the benefit of the free money by taking more and more and more of it out of the hands of, of middle and lower income Alaska families. It is, it is socialism run amok. And, and the failure to, to recognize who the socialists are and who's benefiting from the free money and the amount they're benefiting from the free money is getting in the way of getting to a solution. I mean, this is my problem, Brad, and this is why, I mean, I have not shied away from the discussion of taxes uh, by any means, um, but this is my problem with the idea of, well, if we just put a tax in, we might fix this. They are going to basically, fill, they, they will consume every available dollar. Now, maybe they'll feel the pain a little bit, but the again the overall feel is they're going to consume every available dollar out there and then want more when it's all said and done michael hammond hammond said hammond i mean hammond really thought through these issues hammond said look uh make politicians hurt make them go for taxes for additional spending they'll they'll receive pushback and they won't spend those additional dollars we've not done that i mean we have taxes in the form of pfd cuts but those taxes only affect middle and lower income Alaska families. The top 20%, which all the legislators, legislators fall into, the top 20% aren't affected. They pay a trivial share. The oil companies aren't affected. Non-residents aren't affected. Not industries that employ non-residents. And those are powerful industries in this state. Fish industry, the, the, the tourist industry, they don't really pay. Uh, uh, they, get, they get off with paying their employees less because their employees don't have to pay uh, taxes. So they push back uh, on if they had to pay taxes, they would push back on spending. But right now what's happening, since they don't have to pay taxes, they push for more and more PFD cuts because that's the way they avoid. They look good. Their their PR is good. Yes, we support K through 12 increases. Yes, we support you know child care. Yes, we support university spending. They look good. Their PR is good, but they don't have to pay for it. And until we get them included as part of the class that has to pay for the cost of government, pay a material share of the cost of government, as the middle and lower income Alaska families are doing now, until we push back on them and say, you have to pay, we're not going to get this stopped. And, and you know, and, and Bert's good words to the, to the contrary, notwithstanding, they just can't stop themselves. Even when, even when Ledge Finance says, you're done, you've spent it all. You're right at the twenty at the seventy at the at the seventy five percent line. Kelly Merrick proposes an amendment. Kelly Merrick, a big part of the twenty percent, top point five percent probably, says, "Oh, well, let's just spend a little bit more." I mean, it, that's that's where we've gotten to, and and we've got to get a system where everybody's in this game, everybody's included in having to pay up if the government continues to spend, so that everybody will push back and say, "No, we can't afford that. We've spent enough." Take it out of something else if you need to spend it on this, but don't increase the overall spend. <clears throat> the pro <laughs> and 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 again, the problem is I just don't see how you I just don't see how you stop that appetite, even if they're feeling it. I mean, I don't know. I, I just I I don't see a solution to stopping the appetite to spend everything. Because they know better than us how we should spend all that. They know better. They know what kind of programs we should create so that we're all dependent on them so that they can get reelected, so that they can get more budgets for next year. Um, I mean, it, it, and, and just the, 
the attitude of of um, in almost indifference. I mean, when Rob was talking about trying to eliminate those PCN positions, five you know five hundred positions, and Bert Stedman says, "Well, they don't exist," but the money is still go. I don't. How we just pay no attention to the man behind the curtain? Is that the is that the whole thing? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, somebody else said, "Who was it?" Keel said, "Well, it's it's that money spent on other good things." Josephson, I think, was on this. Oh, it's spent on good things. Well, if it's good things, it should be appropriated, not just given to them and say you spend it on what you think is good things. That's not how it works. Yeah, agency. It's an agency slush fund is essentially how it how it ends up if they if they fall short someplace else or they want to do something new. Uh, they've got uh, they've got funds to do it with, but that's where you end up when when legislators don't have a stake in the game. I mean, they say they do, but they don't. They don't have a personal financial stake in 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 what's going on down there. All companies don't. I mean, yes, we say they'll spend it, they'll spend it all, and they'll and they'll and they'll spend more. But if the oil companies say, "Look, you're going to tax me. I'm not funding your campaign anymore." You're going to tax me. I'm going to fund your opponent, who's 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 going to you know stand up and say that we're not going to spend anymore. If I have to pay for spending, if you're going to restructure things so that if I have to pay for spending, I'm going to I'm going to fund your opponent. Top twenty percent donors say, "Wait, you're going to tax me for this additional stuff? I'm not funding your campaign anymore. I'm funding I'm funding your opponent." Non-resident well, industries. Well, well, you're you're, you're making the industry. argument to keep the status quo. Then at this point, you're making, that's the thing. You're making the argument to say, if they're not going to get campaign contributions because they're going to change the system, I mean that again. That's part of the problem. It's baked in at this point. It is baked in as long as they don't have to pay. As long as somebody doesn't have to pay, it is baked in because because you continue to spend Kelly Merrick. We'll continue to propose amendments that spend more. Julie Colomb will continue to propose programs that spend more because they don't have to pay for it. They, their donors, the oil companies, the 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 the, the non-resident industries uh, don't have to pay for it. If they have to pay for it, there will be a different dynamic. Oh <laughs> man! Um, all right. Well. I wish I wish I, you know, I wish I had more solutions than what we just laid out there, because we've been talking about this for years on this program and it's still the problem still remains. Well, Michael, I guess I would say nothing else has worked. I mean, yeah, we have been talking about these problems for for over a decade now. Nothing has stopped it. And now we're seeing in this legislature that it's getting going again. Yeah. You know, oh, we got a surplus, so we got to spend it. We've got to find a way to stop it, and if and if there's a better way to stop it than making than what that what than what Jay Hammond thought, fine, let's adopt it. But we ought to try what Jay Hammond thought would would help yeah. would help solve it. Ninety seconds here, Brad. Uh, give us your final thoughts for today on the weekly top three. Michael, we've got to get spending under control. I mean, we we've said we we were going to do that. Bert, Bert said, trust me, I'll do it. I'll get it under control. It's not. It's it's spiraling out of control again at a rate faster than, than it did back in the early 20 teens. We've got to get it under control. If we don't, this sort of this the socialism that we just talked about, these sort of annex like, oh, let's protect cook, cook inlet production by subsidizing it and by giving them loans on things that we already own. That's just going to keep that's just going to keep building and building and building. We've got to get spending constrained. And to me, the best way to do that is to make the top 20% responsible uh, for a share of spending in a way that they never that they haven't been and thus doesn't lead them to help try to get these things under control under control. Uh, spending is the issue. Spending has been the issue. I've been saying that for 25 years. We don't have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem. Now we've had so much of a spending problem that we've created both a spending and a revenue problem. And yet they continue, as you said, oh, look, it's a surplus. We can spend it all. No, no, that surplus. I mean, you know, that's not a surplus. That's part of the people's PFD that you're now sucking up and doing, you know, and that's the thing. They will, it, it's Parkinson's principle where everything expands to consume all available resources. They will expand to consume every available dollar, which is, you know, one of the problems with giving them any more is that they're going to just consume it and keep going. That's that's how I that's how I see it. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. 
I appreciate uh, you being part of it today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Um, you mean socialism benefits the politically connected the most? Shocking. We'll be back. Hour two is dead ahead. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.